My friends, a southern officer asked the frightened inhabitants of one Pennsylvania town, how do you like this way of our coming back into the Union? It was in the morrow of battle, fast rain, the shot and shell. I was standing close beside him, and I saw him when he fell. So I took him in my arm and laid him on the grass. It was going against orders, but they think it let it pass. It was a mini ball that struck him. It entered at his side, but we didn't think it's fatal till this morning, but he died. The greatest battle ever fought in the Western Hemisphere began as a clash over shoes. At dawn on July 1st, a Confederate infantry officer led his men toward the little crossroads town of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, within view of a Lutheran seminary whose high cupola offered a fine prospect of the surrounding farms and rolling hills. There was rumored to be a supply of shoes at Gettysburg, and the foot-sore rebels were there to commandeer them. The South came in from the North that day, and the North came in from the South. On the outskirts of town, the Confederates ran headlong into General John Buford's Union cavalry. While both sides sent couriers pounding off for reinforcements, Buford tried desperately to hold his ground. But the Confederates finally overwhelmed him and pushed the Union forces back toward town. People were running here and there, screaming that the town would be shelled. No one knew where to go or what to do. My husband went to the garden and picked a mess of beans, for he declared the rebels should not have one. Sally Broadhead. Every Confederate and Union division in the area now converged on Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. By mid-afternoon, Confederate troops occupied Gettysburg and Union forces had been driven back south of the town. There, Major General Winfield Scott Hancock managed to rally the fleeing troops into defensive positions on Culp's Hill and Cemetery Ridge. A sign near the cemetery's gateway read, all persons found using firearms in these grounds will be prosecuted with the utmost rigor of the law. During the battle, the artist Alfred Wode sketched the action, sending his drawings back to New York for engraving. Meanwhile, Sam Wilkerson of the New York Times filed dispatches, sitting next to the fresh grave of his son. Lee arrived in the middle of the afternoon, set up headquarters, and urged Ewell to renew the attack before nightfall. Ewell chose not to. His men needed rest. By the end of the day, the Union Army held the high ground. Rather than attack it headlong, Confederate General Longstreet wanted to swing around the Union position and take a stand between Meade's army and Washington, then let the Union attack. Without knowing the enemy's strength, Lee overruled Longstreet. No, said Lee, I'm going to whip them here, or they are going to whip me. He had always counted on Stuart and his cavalry for intelligence as to enemy positions and movements. And he was lacking that. He was groping around the, uh, around the landscape blind. And people would come up to him in the field all through those days. And he said, can you tell me where Stuart is? Have you seen my cavalry? A very strange thing for a commander to have to ask. So when Stuart arrived, all he had to show for all this was a couple of hundred wagons and mules and everything else. and he. He saw Lee standing there sternly looking at him arriving late. 
and he, he blew the thing by making his announcement at the start. And he said, General, I brought you 200 brand new wagons. And Lee said, General, they're an impediment to me now. I ask you to help me whip these people. And uh, it was a, a, a severe admonishment from Lee. And uh, Lee saw he'd hurt his feelings. So he said, come, it'll be all right. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll be all right. I cannot sleep. We know not what the morrow will bring forth. I think little has been gained so far. Has our army been sufficiently reinforced? Sally Broadhead. Compared to what was coming, the day had been a skirmish. My dear son Albert, I received your affectionate letter yesterday and I assure you, my dear son, it gives me great relief of mind to hear that you and your dear brothers were still in the land of the living. I had not heard one word from you since Barlow Rogers returned home. May God bless you, my dear Albert, your devoted father, Thomas Batchelor. Through the night, the two armies continued to gather. After a 35-mile all-night march, Union General John Sedgwick arrived with his 6th Corps. By morning, 65,000 Confederates faced 85,000 Federal troops commanded by General George Meade. Hills overlooked the Federal position at either end. To the north on the Union right, Culp's Hill and Cemetery Hill. To the south, the Big and Little Round Tops. Lee wanted them taken. Meade was no less determined to hold his ground. All commanders are authorized to order the instant death of any soldier who fails in his duty at this hour. It took Longstreet all morning and most of the afternoon to shift two divisions into position for the assault on the round tops. Assigned to hold the Union position was General Dan Sickles, a turbulent ex-Tammany Hall politician best known before the war for having shot and killed his wife's lover. Now Sickles disobeyed orders and marched his men further out from Little Round Top to the Devil's Den, the wheat field, and into the peach orchard beyond. He was half a mile in front of the Union line on a flat, exposed position that left the Round Tops completely undefended. The rest of the army was amazed. Uh, someone said he stuck out like a sore thumb. And I think it was Hancock who saw him go out and he said, wait a while, you'll see him tumbling back. And of course he did. The Confederates finally attacked at four o'clock in the afternoon. As they swept forward, the 15th Alabama Regiment scrambled up Big Round Top. From there, well above the fighting, Colonel William C. Oates saw his chance. Little Round Top was completely undefended. From that position, Oates said, he could blow the whole Union Army apart. Within half an hour, I could convert Little Round Top into a Gibraltar that I could hold against 10 times the number of men that I had. Meanwhile, Meade dispatched General G.K. Warren to the summit. He immediately saw the danger. Only a handful of signalmen held the hill. Oates' Confederates were moving down and around the Union left. Warren sent at once for reinforcements. Four Union regiments raced up Little Round Top. In a moment, all was excitement. Every soldier seemed to understand the situation and to be inspired by its danger. Away we went, under the terrible artillery fire. Shells were exploding on every side. But our men appeared to be as cool and deliberate in their movements as if they had been forming a line upon the parade ground in camp. Up the steep hillside, we ran and reached the crest. At the extreme left of the Union line now was Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain's 20th Maine. Oates' Alabamians were already moving between the two hills. 
Chamberlain.